there is no shortage of things to worry about. How about global warming causing life-threatening flooding, drought, fires, and Category 5 hurricanes? Or another global pandemic? Or international bank collapse? A global world war breaking out because of conflict with Hamas, the Middle East, China, Russia, or North Korea? Or if artificial intelligence is released to make amoral decisions in every area of life? Or a mass shooting event taking place in your neighborhood, school, shopping mall, or church? Or your doctor tells you that you have only three months to live? If these possibilities increase your anxiety level, then you will want to join Vicki Hitzkiss, Kent Edwards, and Nathan Norman as they search for stability in our unstable and unpredictable world in Psalm 121. Welcome to Crosstalk, a Christian podcast whose goal is for us to encourage each other to not only increase our knowledge of the Bible, but to take the next step beyond information into transformation. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life, into all our lives. I'm Brian French. Today, Dr. Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkiss, and Nathan Norman continue their discussion through the Psalms. And if you have a Bible handy, turn to Psalm 121 as we join their discussion. There's no question that we live in perilous times. <laughs> Brian just reminded us of that. When you think about the next 10 years, what are some of your worries? In addition to what Brian already, <laughs> already <laughs> freaked us out with. a pretty good list. <laughs> uh, well, inflation on top of that right? Can mm -hmm. you afford anything? And I know one of the questions with not even young people, but middle-aged people are, can I ever afford a house right now? The income disparity and the price of housing and not even a house. How can I live in an apartment and, uh, and afford what's happening here? Uh, that That's a huge concern. There's simply not a lot of housing even available. Um, yeah. Interest rates have gone up, shot up and Many people have low interest rates, so they're not, the ones with low interest rates aren't selling. <laughs> so there's almost nothing to buy. And even if you do try, the high interest rates make it impossible to pay for it. And then landlords take advantage of you mm -hmm. and can charge whatever they want. And you really have no option between sleeping in their apartment or your car. I'm not there yet, but I watched my parents grow old and I'm not looking forward to growing old. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, t you, take, you take all that for granted. You know it's coming when you're a kid, but... It comes, and uh, you think about things. You don't want a two-story house; you want a one-story house. You, you know, just mm -hmm. you just think you think about life differently. Years ago, I broke my back, and I used to ski, and I used to water ski, and I used to uh, ride horses. And I don't do that stuff anymore because I know in a moment your life can change forever. Oh, yeah. I I think even for ten years, you know, especially with all of my kids, I'm like wondering and concerned are they going to make the correct moral choices yeah in this world with so many divergent moral options and so many harmful moral options that are being thrown at them at such a young age i was talking to my daughter recently and i said i'm sorry that life is more confusing for you now than when i was your age and she said well was it confusing when you were you know my age i said yeah in some ways but now i mean you have all of these things being thrown at you which you should never have to think about Mm -hmm. And uh, and now and here you are. And not just options, but pressures. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's hard. I guess knowing the uncertainty of life and the dangers we face, that's probably one of the reasons Psalm 121 is one of my favorite psalms. Like last week, Psalm 121 is another song of ascents, a song sung by pilgrims in their way to worship in the temple in Jerusalem. Every Jew wanted to worship at least one time in their life in Jerusalem at the temple. And they would all want one time in their life to make that pilgrimage. Uh, have you guys ever been to the Holy Land? I have. I was baptized in the Jordan River. Oh, wow. wow. I yeah. was not. I, <laughs> you weren't baptized in the Jordan River? Nor have I been to the Holy Land. No. Yeah. You know, of all the places I travel with crosstalk all over the world, <laughs> I'd never been to... The Holy Land, never been to Jerusalem. I'd love to see the Sea of Galilee, just kind of get a perspective of what it's like. I'd, I'd love to go to, to Greece and Turkey and the steps of Rome, uh, the Apostle Paul, but yeah, haven't done that. Um, but 
I have it on good authority because I've read books about Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> and it tells me that it rests on a hill some 2,500 feet above sea level. So when the pilgrim approaches on his way to worship at the temple, you can tell that he's afraid. We hear fear in his voice when he says in verse 1, He says, I'll lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where does my help come? That's kind of interesting because for many of us, mountains are kind of where we go on vacation. <laughs> it's a place of rest and relaxation. And But he was afraid. He was afraid when he took a look at those those hills. Why? Well, I sort of know the answer to this because this was something I had to, uh, this psalm I had to memorize when I was in the sixth grade. And I remember hmm. reciting it to my father and I read it, I recited it like this. I lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. And he stopped <laughs> me and he said, no, that's not, that's not how to say that. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. That's a question. Right. And, and, uh, because I was thinking like you, like when you drive through Colorado, that's <laughs> <laughs> from whence cometh my help, you know? And he said, no, he said, Vicki, there were robbers in those mountains. Mm -hmm. There were robbers and animals and bandits and all kinds of bad things. And, and the psalmist is saying, where does my help come from when I'm going to these mountains? So I never forgot that. Yeah. You go into the mountains, that's a great hiding place for bad guys. Right? It's like going uh, down a, a dark alley when you go to Manhattan. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Manhattan's pretty safe. We're talking Brooklyn here, maybe. <laughs> maybe the Bronx. <laughs> well, okay, I was you. thinking Harlem. Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, Harlem's pretty cleaned up these days. <laughs> well, be, be, be a pain here, Nathan. But anyway, yeah. I got to defend my territory. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, you New Yorkers. <laughs> and, and then he answers it. He says, my help cometh from the Lord, who makes heaven and earth. Yeah. Unpack this for me. Why does this verse allow the pilgrim to push forward, Nathan? When he says, my help comes from the Lord, all capital letters, the maker of heaven and earth. He finds comfort in that. Why? Well, two reasons. One, because the Lord, Yahweh, he has made a covenant with his people. He's, ah. he's going to keep his promises. And how that looks, what that looks like, they don't know, but they know that God cares for them, and he's in control, which is kind of the second point, the maker of heaven and earth. Okay, if he made everything that we see here, he's in control. He can take care of me. He's powerful enough to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's the covenant God. It's just like we are his wife, and we're the bride of Christ, and he is our husband. And a good husband cares for his wife, right? Mm-hmm. To nurture, to protect, and and we know we can, because as you said, there's nothing that lurks in those mountains that is greater than our God. He made everything, so he is capable of keeping his promise. Whew. And that doesn't just apply to people in ancient Israel, does it? That no, applies. it applies today because I can remember being a kid being asked to go down into the basement at night to get something. And I would be singing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. <laughs> <laughs> Terrified of that place. <laughs> I don't, we don't have basements in Texas, but I don't like basements either. Uh, I got, and you know what? Nothing ever got me down there. So, <laughs> <laughs> No, but that's kind of what the, the psalmist is singing, isn't he? Yeah. I know you're my God, and I know you'll look after me. And what's fascinating in this psalm is that he begins to tease that out. What does that care that God has for us. What does that look like? And, and he begins by saying, God will look after him constantly. In verse 3, he goes into detail. He will not let your foot slip. At this point, the pilgrim is now going up the mountain. <laughs> and as he comes to Jerusalem, he's not flying into the Tel Aviv airport or he's not riding in an air-conditioned car. As he's approaching Jerusalem, he's wearing sandals, not hiking boots. And his foot slips. And he could have a injure himself badly with a fall. But he says, no, God will not let your foot slip. 
God helps him regain his balance, and he continues safely the rest of the day. But when evening comes and he has to make camp and set up his tent, who will watch over him when he sleeps? Because when you're asleep in a tent, you're vulnerable to animals and bandits, but you can't stay awake and protect yourself. You got to sleep. Fortunately, God does not sleep. What does he say in the last part of verse 3 and 4? He will not allow your foot to slip. Your protector will not slumber. Indeed, the protector of Israel does not slumber or sleep. Woo. So when the pilgrim has to sleep, God is not asleep at the switch. By the way, <laughs> I think this may be an allusion to uh, Elijah's conflict with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Do you remember that? Oh, how I do. I did a first person on this. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> Where he's, he's telling the prophets of Baal to call on their God to light the fire without setting, you know, flame to it. And, uh, and as they're doing it all morning long, nothing happens. And he says, oh, call out your God. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's on the toilet. <laughs> Is that what he said? Maybe he's on the toilet? Yeah. Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah, maybe he's relieving himself. <laughs> Bail's up there on the toilet. Like, oh, shoot, I'm coming. Hold on, I'm almost done. <laughs> he had like a magazine or something in there. <laughs> I remember this story, too. And then, and then he pours water all over his altar, everywhere. And then, boom, fire. I remember telling this to a 10-year-old Sunday school class, and the little boy sitting next to me went, even the water? Even the water started on fire? And I said, yes, Michael, even the water. That oh. is how cool God is. And wow. he jumped up and he ran around the room. He was so excited. Oh, wow. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. Well, that's what the, the psalmist is saying. He will not let your foot slip day or night. He's not slumbering. His care for his people is constant. God is the great insomniac. He never sleeps. <laughs> when we're tired and we don't have energy, God is with us all the time. But not only is his care constant, it's also comprehensive. Look at what he says in verse 5 and 6. He says, The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. Whew. See, I grew up in Canada, and uh, so I always was cold most of the time. And yeah. so I longed to be living in the desert. I thought that would be wonderful. You don't get cold, you'd be nice and warm. Until now living in Southern California and having some exposure to the desert, I don't want to live in the desert either. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, there's a reason they call Death Valley, Death Valley, right? It's hot. You will die there. The sun is your enemy. You, In fact, the critters that survive in the desert do so by hiding from the sun and coming out at night. They don't, they don't want to face the sun right on. We've learned uh, living in Southern California with lots of sun that uh, you don't even want to park your cars outside. You want to keep stuff inside because the sun will destroy whatever it hits. And the psalmist says... He is my shade. God will protect me during the daytime from that which can harm me. And not only that, he will protect me from the moon at night. That sounds kind of strange to us. Why do we need to protect by the moon? But people genuinely believed that the light from the moon could make you crazy. <laughs> That's where we get the word lunacy. Oh. You would be psychologically injured by the light of the moon. The psalmist is saying, look, God protects us from physical dangers, psychological pressures. God is always adequate. Even when we sleep, God protects us from the light of the moon. And by the way, the snakes, the scorpions, the mountain lions, the lions, the bears that live in those mountains, he'll protect you from that as well. God's care for his people is constant. It is comprehensive and it is continuous. Look at verses seven and eight. 
It says, the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. Hmm. It will never end. Vicki, you've spoken in the past of the pressures of old age, right? Uh Uh-huh. As we grow older, we become more vulnerable. We become more needy. I've had my friends who are older tell me that uh, old age is not for the... um, Not for sissies? Yeah, it's not for sissies. It is challenging. And God says... He will watch over your life, your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. When we're at our weakest, when we have no strength to look after ourselves, God is with us, and he will never leave us, and he will never forsake us. An old story is told of in America during the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln was the president. As he was wont to do, he would visit the troops. There was this one young man who was lying in the hospital tent, gravely injured. The soldier had the audacity to, when he saw the president to say, could you help me write a letter to my family to say goodbye? Abraham Lincoln stopped and wrote the letter as the boy dictated it. And then the young man said, will you stay with me? And the president said he would. He stayed for one hour and two and three. He stayed by the side of that boy until it was almost daylight when the boy passed. The president would not leave. He wanted to be by his side. We have a, we have a God who will not leave us. He will not give up. He will not get tired of us. We have a God who cares for us constantly comprehensively and continuously. It's never ending and always sufficient. The world is full of opportunities for disaster. But of all the things Brian mentioned and we have thought of, ah, which falls outside of God's control? Which of those problems is he unable to help us with? No. We have a God who was always faithful and will always be with us because we are his people. I think of what Moses reminded the people of as they were entering the promised land. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, do you remember the words that Moses spoke to Joshua? Yeah, it says, The Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. I have a question. Mm -hmm. My grandfather fought in World War I, and he had his leg pretty much blown off. They told him, you're never going to walk again, but he did. And he walked two miles in the morning and two miles in the afternoon, just stubbornness pretty much. (laughs) And then he came back, and he lived in Harlem, and he got beat up by hoodlums Hmm. twice. And the second time it was so bad, my mom and dad went up and brought him back to Dallas, which was really hard on him. You just, you can't displace an old person. And this psalm, um, proverb, whatever it is, almost cost him his faith because he took God at his word and he believed God was going to protect him. And God didn't. And when I I was telling a friend yesterday, uh, Friday, about this she she had a crazy ex-husband her daughter had a crazy ex-husband and he is now threatening their son he's saying i'm going to come kill you and she is telling them don't be afraid the bible tells you don't be afraid and i said to her you know the truth is he may kill your son and um 
she was quoting scripture, <laughs> he may kill her son. What do you make of that? I mean, this sounds good, and it's it was a good lesson, but I don't think it's true. What uh, you don't think it's true? Yeah, I mean, God may be continuous and constant and all that other stuff, but He'll let your foot be moved. He'll 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 watch while somebody beats you up, and the sun will burn you, and and I mean, the, uh, scorpions will sting you, and whatever else you said won't happen. It'll happen. This psalm does not promise nothing is going bad is going to happen to you in life. It does not promise that. The fact is, we live in a fallen world. There is evil. And this does not say we live in a bubble where nothing bad can happen to his people. It does say that nothing happens to us that God has not allowed. It does not mean that we don't have disappointments. It doesn't mean that we are not attacked. It does not mean that, but it does mean that nothing happens that is outside of God's control. It kind of sucks the juice out of this promise, don't you think? I think it says that I have the confidence that in the midst of this, my God has not forsaken me. I, I believe that. I do believe that. Do you have anything to add, Nathan? Like you, you when you were a kid and you went downstairs, trusting God to protect you in the basement? Yeah, it's hard. It's, I think the comfort of this is that he will not leave us. He won't forsake us. He goes before us, right? Just as Deuteronomy 31. It's not that Joshua didn't have problems or trials or difficulties. He, he did. He still had enemies. But God was with him through it all. And there is a mystery to the problem of pain, right? Because intellectually, I can answer the problem of pain pretty readily. Why does God allow us to suffer if he loves us so much and if he's all powerful? Right. Uh, well, it, part of the reason could be for my growth. It could be for somebody else's growth. Uh, it could be that God has a plan that will, uh, in the story of Joseph and Genesis, what others intended for evil, God will use for good. I might not see that good. It might be good in a million generations from now. I have no way of knowing uh, what it's going to look like. But I trust that everything God does for those of us who are in Christ Jesus is for my good and for the good of others. Uh, that's intellectual though. Emotionally responding to this is really hard because, you know, why did the, that couple have a miscarriage? Why uh, did my friend die at a young age? Uh, why does God allow children to suffer uh, over in Israel and Palestine? Those are intellectually, you can answer those, but that in the same way I just answered uh, it a second ago, but, but emotionally, pastorally, no, it's, it's, I'm miserable. I don't understand why you're allowing me to go through this God. And that's why there's other Psalms here. That's that shout out to God, like Psalm 13. Mm -hmm. Where are you, God? Why have you abandoned me? Have you forgotten about me? And then we have these to balance them out to say, no, I'm with you in the midst of the suffering. And there is nothing that happens to you that is outside of my control. And I know it hurts and I know that you can't understand it right now, but I do have a good plan for you. And one day it will all make sense. And one day I'm going to make it up to you, right? Cause Paul said our present suffering is not worth comparing to the future glory that we have in Christ Jesus. And I, I have to take that on faith because I can't understand that because some of the pain I've gone through, I don't understand how God can say, I'm going to make it up for you and it's going to be far better. You're not even going to remember it. It's not even worth comparing to. You're not even going to bring it up back up. You could bring it back up in your memory, but you won't because it's so wonderful compared to the misery that you're in right now. I don't understand that. So I have to trust in that. But it is hard because there's an emotional side of it, which is why I think we have the Psalms to balance those things out. Yes, he's walking with me and yes, everything is within his control. But there are times where I feel like he isn't in control and he doesn't have my best interest in mind. Uh, and that's where I and I have no clue about your uncle, but I, I actually just talked with a, a, a bunch of seniors. And I said, I know growing up with me, I was, you know, you don't complain to God. And meanwhile, I read the Psalms and I'm like, you know what? I feel this way and I'm going to complain to God. I feel like you've abandoned me. I feel like you don't care. I feel like you're messing with my life. I'm going to complain. And the amazing thing, at least in like Psalm 13, is here David complains and then his situation doesn't change, but his emotions change where he feels comforted by God. I think God is our father. 
And I find it interesting to see how um, good fathers raise their kids. Even if a father has lots of resources, a good father doesn't shield his kids from the tough times of life, right? Mm -hmm. Your Not father can love you and have resources, and you have to go out and scrabble hard and get a tough job and pay your own rent, and your God could have eliminated all of that. Um, but he did, your father didn't do it, and God doesn't do that. I think he allows us to do that and to face these things for growth opportunities. That doesn't mean he doesn't care. That doesn't mean he's not there. But it does mean that he allows us to learn through even difficult times in life. So, you know, even for your your, your dad, um, Vicky, you know, he came down with Parkinson's, right? Yeah. I mean, I visited him and it was really tough to visit him at the end. It was really tough to know who he was and what he was now facing. You know, I flew back home thinking, why would a good God allow that, right? Mm -hmm. My mother-in-law passed away with ovarian cancer after years of struggle. Why would the godliest woman I ever have met, why would God allow that? I don't know. But I know that your father and my mother-in-law, they were convinced that God had not abandoned them. I don't think they understood why God was doing this but they could rest in the assurance that they had uh, a good shepherd in Psalm 23 that would be with them even till the end. So uh, I think Nathan's right. I think there's a tension. Um, why does God allow bad things? And I wrestle with that with God, but I rest in the, in the confidence that the God who saved me, loves me, and is with me. And he will not allow anything that I couldn't handle to come my way. Not to be not to beat a dead horse, you don't have to include this, but why does it say he will not suffer your foot to be moved? Yeah, he will. <laughs> I, was, I take that, that um, when you're on the edge of a mountain road, that uh, he can be there and keep you on the path instead of slipping to your death. Meaning it's his choice? Yeah, he's there to help you. I think I can how many times has God intervened to save me from tragedy? And obviously I won't know because my foot didn't slip. Right? And um, sometimes you do know. I remember being in a car full of Christians and we almost lost control and everybody yelled out just spontaneously, God, Father, help us and <laughs> we straightened out. Wow. One of the scariest times of my life was we were pastoring in northern Canada. I was driving Nola to work down this highway, um, pretty well deserted highway, just two lanes, early, early in the morning. And it's, you know, 35 below zero. I mean, it's really cold out there. And as I looked, I saw what scares anyone who lives in those kind of climates, shiny pavement, black ice. Mm. I immediately did what I knew I should do. I took my foot off the gas. You can't hit the brakes, right? It gets, you'll just slide and, and there's no recovery. Um, took my foot off the gas to slowly begin to slow down, but my, the car began to move slightly to the left and I had to correct it to go to the right. And then I had to correct it. And so I'm going back and forth and back and forth. And, and I can't stop it, right? Like, and, the, and I'm, this, I'm going closer and closer to the edge of the road down the ditch and coming towards us was a semi-trailer. A big truck was coming. And I know he couldn't stop because mm. he's on black ice and I can't stop. Um, and finally, I knew if I went back and forth one more time, we're going to be crashing into the ditch. So I prayed and turned the wheel as far left as I possibly could and hit the brakes. And we spun around two or three times. We ended up stopped in the right proper lane, heading in the right direction, and watch, the, and watch that 18-wheeler pass us with the driver's eyes wide open on the other <laughs> side. That, that's a God thing. Yeah. Mm. That, that's not stunt driving. That's God saying, I want to use you. I think his, his care for us is constant, it is comprehensive, and it's continuous. It's not, doesn't mean that there aren't times when, like my brother, 
he got him black eyes and he and his wife were killed. Mm. It does not mean it'll never happen to Christians. But that does not mean that he didn't also care for my brother. I don't know why he took my brother home and saved me. I, 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 I don't know. I do know that one day I'm going to look into God's eyes and I will not ask that question because I will know his character more clearly and I'll rest in that. That God is your God and he's with you today. What do we do when we're tempted to be afraid or discouraged? Remember, God's care is constant, comprehensive, and continuous. Bad things may happen to us, but they can only happen with the permission and the knowledge of our loving, wise, and powerful Heavenly Father who wants good for us and cares for us. So fear not. God loves you. He is always in control. I trust that today's discussion of God's Word has been helpful and served as an encouragement to not just be hearers of the Word, but doers. Together, let's bring God's Word to life, to our lives, this week. The Crosstalk Podcast is a production of Crosstalk Global, equipping biblical communicators so every culture hears God's voice. To find out more about this educational nonprofit organization, please visit www.crosstalkglobal.org. You can also support this show by rating it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find it. Be sure to listen next Friday as we continue our discussion of the Psalms. You won't want to miss it. What does he say at the last part of verse 3 and 4? Sorry, it's not written here. I must I skip that. Yeah, I guess I'll pull it up on my phone and find out. <laughs> Sorry to give you that extra work. This is why I didn't hit pause, because I knew Vicky was going to push back as soon as it was over. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it a real show. It makes it good. It does. So People want to know that. I think I'll put, the, I'll put this in somewhere. Okay, good. Okay.